A quick note before I begin. This will be another podcast style video. Minimal footage available for this one. Let's dive in. Elizabeth Forshi, most commonly referred to as Liz, was born May 13, 1978. She lived in Truckee, California, with her mother, father, and her younger brother. When Liz was 13 years old, a man named Michael Saipoda and his wife Sally would move into the house across the street from them. Shortly after the Saipodas moved in, they would have two children, and they found parenting life difficult to adjust to. Michael worked a lot, and he expressed that he wanted his wife to go back to work as well. So after some conversation, the couple decided that they might need some assistance looking after their newly borns. So Michael presents the idea to his wife that the young girl who lives across the street, Liz, could possibly babysit for them. Michael's wife agrees to this, and 14 years old at the time, Liz, begins to watch the Saipurda children. It is reported that Liz would spend hours upon hours every day over at the Saipurda house babysitting. When she is 15 years old, tragedy strikes, and her father loses his battle with cancer. This was said to have affected Liz greatly, and her mother describes that following the death, Liz became very vulnerable and impressionable, and had even begun to look up to her neighbour, Michael, as a bit of a father figure. The daily babysitting became more and more, and she would now not only go there during the days, but would also spend her time there long into the nights. This continues for about two years. As time passes, Michael wants to move his family to Iowa to be closer to his mother, and upon making the decision to do so, he requests that Liz come with them as a live-in nanny. She agrees, but Liz's mother greatly protests against the idea. She had never had a friendship with the Saipotas, and felt as though her daughter leaving to go with them was bad news. Liz's mother isn't the only one who has an issue with this. One of the girl's closest friends would also advise Liz not to go, but she is adamant that she will be leaving. So upset by the thought, Liz's mother even contacts Child Protective Services to see if they can do anything to stop her from leaving. But unfortunately, nothing could be done. And around 1994, 17-year-old Liz, who still had two years left of school, drops out, packs up her belongings, and moves from California to Iowa with the Saipurda family. After the move, Liz's mother and her best friend would maintain contact with her as frequently as they could, usually speaking once a week with her via landline telephone or by sending letters through the mail. It's around this point in time that Michael and his wife Sally's marriage breaks down and they get a divorce. Sally moves out of the house, leaving Liz with Michael and their two children. After the divorce, she still maintains contact with her children but cuts off pretty much all communication with her ex-husband, and she doesn't speak to Liz anymore either. Shortly after she moves out, the teenager Liz and Michael, who's close to his 40s, begin a romantic relationship. Despite her mother being firmly against this relationship, she still tries to maintain a connection with her daughter. And when Liz finished schooling through an outside-of-school program in Iowa, she would purchase her daughter a gift, an emerald and diamond ring. Liz cherished this gift and would wear it everywhere. Whenever anyone saw her, she had it on, and was known to only take it off when she bathed. This relationship between Liz and Michael seemed troubled from the get-go. Shortly after they got together, both Liz's mother and best friend back in California described that it had become harder and harder for them to contact the young woman. It is reported that Michael did not like that she spoke to them and would often become enraged when she did. On two separate occasions, Liz would go back to California to visit, once for Christmas and another time for her brother's graduation. On both of these occasions, she came alone. Michael did not join. But when she was with her friends and family, he would call her constantly. If she answered the calls, her mother would overhear conversations and could tell that Michael was not happy. He would yell and scream at her and command her to come back to Iowa immediately. When Liz would get off of these phone calls, she seems distressed and confused. 
She wanted to leave Michael, but was unsure if she should. On the second occasion, when she visited for her brother's graduation, she was initially staying with her mother, but after a few days, Michael would demand that she go somewhere else, because he was fearful that her mother would manipulate her into staying there. Liz agrees and leaves her mother's house to go stay with her best friend, who, at the time, was living with her partner. Both of these friends of Liz report that as soon as she arrived, the phone calls begun. They would say the phone rang incessantly. Michael would call at all hours of the day and night, and they would occur every 15 minutes. In a similar fashion to what happened when she was at her mum's house, the people around Liz would overhear Michael yelling and screaming at her through the phone, even threatening to kill her if she didn't come back. He would also say things such as, he's going to fly to California and kill her mother and brother. Fed up with this, Liz's friend's husband answers one of these calls and tells Michael to stop contacting her whilst she's there. When this happens, Michael threatens to come there and kill him and his son. As a result, the phone is unplugged so that they could all get some relief. When Liz is scheduled to be on a flight back to Iowa, her best friend desperately doesn't want her to return and fears that she'll never see Liz again. Liz assures her that everything will be fine, but her friend doesn't believe it. When driving Liz to the airport, she takes all of the back streets she can in the hope that Liz will miss her flight. But as fate would have it, the plane was delayed and Liz makes it on. Whilst Liz is back in Iowa, around 1996, she attends church and meets a woman by the name of Harper Tracy. The two become close friends and spend a fair bit of time together. During their friendship, Harper observes multiple signs that Liz was suffering abuse. Finger marks and bruising on her neck and bruising on her abdomen when asked about this, Liz would assure her that it's nothing, and she was adamant that police are not to be called. There is an incident where Harper's seven-year-old daughter, who was friends with Michael's children that were around the same age, she was playing in the backyard with them at the Cyperta house. The young girl goes inside to get her shoes, and sees Liz and Michael arguing at the top of the stairs. Liz turns around to walk down the stairs, and when she does so, Michael shoves her from behind, causing her to fall forward and down the stairs. When Liz reaches the bottom, she looks at the young girl who witnessed this and tells her that everything is okay, please go outside and play with the others. Following this event, on one occasion, in the middle of the night, Liz arrives at Harper's door unannounced. She is frantic and scared and she tells Harper that she can't take any more of the abuse. She needs a place to stay. Harper lets her in and allows Liz to stay on the couch. But once again, Liz refuses to call the police. Harper lived in a trailer that had no landline, nor did she or Liz have cell phones. But this didn't stop Michael from contacting them. He would park on the street outside the trailer and hurl abuse from the window of his truck. He would yell things such as, Liz will never see the children again, something that upset her greatly as she had formed a special bond with them. They even referred to her as mum. Michael would also yell that he's going to get rid of her and nobody would know or care. Nobody would ever find her. He would leave aggressive notes on the doorstep. One time, he even left the torn collar of Liz's cat with a note that read, if she didn't come back, she'd disappear like the cat did. Liz would say that she's terrified of him, and that he follows her everywhere. Anywhere that she goes, he's there watching. Around this time period, Liz had graduated from an alternative school for students who dropped out. She was still in contact with the director of the school, and the director would say that Liz had disclosed to her once that Michael sexually, physically, and emotionally abused her, starting long before they moved to Iowa. Again though, Liz would refuse all ideas of going to a battered woman's shelter, or to the police, and she was adamant that doing this would only make her situation worse. She stays at the trailer with Harper for a few days, but eventually returns to the house with Michael. Harper loses contact with Liz after this, as she is not allowed to ever visit the house, and Liz doesn't reach out to her anymore. 
even telling Harper that she must stop communicating with her, as doing so was making life very hard. Two months after returning to the house, on January 31st, 1998, Liz and Michael get married. Once again, Liz's mother is very much against this, even to the point where she refuses to attend the wedding. Time passes, and Liz is 22 years old. She works at a company folding envelopes. Here she meets another woman by the name of Sarah. The two become friends, and Sarah gives Liz lifts to and from work every day. Sarah was living in an apartment in the same street where Michael and Liz resided. She was in a relationship with a woman at the time, and had been for two years, and they both lived together in this apartment. Despite this, Liz and Sarah would develop feelings for one another, and had begun to act upon them. One day, when Michael was out of the house, Liz and Sarah were engaged in sexual activity in the bedroom. The two young Cyperta children would peek through the keyhole and saw this happening. When Liz learns that they saw them, she becomes terrified that Michael might find out. She packs as much as she can and immediately leaves to move in with Sarah. Sarah's partner at the time knew of Liz, but was unaware of the feelings between the two. She assumed that they were good friends and nothing more. She also knew of the situation to some extent with Michael and his abusive ways, but for the most part, she did not want to get involved. The day Liz leaves to live with Sarah is June 16th, year 2000. That very day when Michael learns of his wife leaving, he is furious. He suspects she might be at Sarah's house and decides to pay them a visit. Sarah's partner, Terry, recalls that both Sarah and Liz weren't home when she got there late that night. When she does get home, she notices that there were 30 messages on the voicemail. She begins listening to them, but only gets through five. They were all from the same number, Michael's number. Each one she listens to increase in intensity. At first, he is begging for Liz to come home. But as they go on, he becomes angrier and angrier cursing and threatening to come and get her. Terry attempts to ignore what's going on, and takes her dog out for a walk. As she leaves the house, she hears someone shouting her name. It was Michael, who's walking up the street. She's slightly confused because she's never met the man before, and as he walks toward her, he appears intoxicated, holding a bottle of alcohol in his hand, and his two young children behind him crying. Upon reaching Terry, Michael explains that his wife left him, is not answering his calls, and he doesn't know what to do. Whilst this is happening, Terry informs him that she doesn't think his children should be here for this, so Michael sends them home. They walk back down the street, and Michael assures her that his mother will be there soon to look after them. It's at this point, Sarah and Liz arrive in Sarah's car. They park for less than a second, because as soon as they spot Michael, they drive away again. Michael, furious, now yells at Terry to help him and to follow them. Terry is confused, and under pressure, she agrees to help. She puts the dog in the back seat of her car, and they both jump in to follow the vehicle. They track Sarah and Liz to a nearby store and see that they've parked in the parking lot. Terry pulls up a few car spaces away and instantly, Michael jumps out and runs towards the vehicle with Liz in it. Sarah manages to get out before he gets to the car, and the doors are all locked behind her. As Michael screams and yells at Liz through the closed window, Sarah and Terry have an argument, where Terry learns that Sarah and Liz are romantically involved. This argument is cut short, because they hear Michael scratching the car with his keys. Terry, wanting this to be over, and aggravated at the situation overall, unlocks the door, giving Michael access to Liz. When she does this, the man pushes her to the ground and then kicks her in the back. He then attempts to grab Liz from the car, but she is resisting. He tears her shirt in the process, and is punching and hitting her as she is half dragged out of the seat. Sarah and Terry manage to wrestle Michael to the ground, and Terry holds him whilst Sarah jumps in the car and drives away. Terry is now stuck with Michael, alone in the parking lot, but he seems to not be directing any of his anger and frustration at her. He just keeps saying over and over that Liz is going to regret it. 
Terry gives him a lift back to a spot nearby to his house, and then shortly after this, she packs her belongings and leaves Sarah and the apartment. On the night of this incident, Sarah and Liz do go to the police, and as a result of the attack, a no-contact order is granted. Michael must completely stay away from Liz. In the days that followed, phone call after phone call is placed to Sarah's house, but each time, the person on the other end hangs up. Suspecting Michael is behind these, police are once again contacted, and a trap is placed on the phone line. From the 26th of June, all the way up to July 16th, 162 phone calls are recorded to have come from Michael. Throughout this period of time, Sarah and Liz agree to break up. This is due to Liz's drinking habits and the constant phone calls from Michael placing a strain on Sarah's mental health. The breakup is mutually agreed upon, and Liz insists that she is not going back to Michael this time. She is prepared to leave him for good, adopting her maiden name and opening a new bank account under this name. Sarah also agrees to let Liz stay on the couch until she finds a place to live and get on her feet. This leads us to the night of July 16th. Sarah leaves for work at 10pm, and Liz is in the apartment by herself. When Sarah gets home at 4am, Liz is not there. There's no signs of forced entry, but things do seem odd. All of Liz's belongings are in the apartment. Her clothes, her ID, her purse, and the dog had been placed in the bathroom, like it so often would when they had to go out and leave it home alone. Sarah becomes worried, and files a missing persons report. Strangely enough, she notices that the phone line is oddly quiet, and the phone trap indicates that the last call ever made to this number from Michael occurred at 10.52pm that night, after she left for work. Police become involved with the search for Liz, but they cannot find her anywhere. There are some reports that she was spotted in different locations, but nothing solid. The most detailed lead regarding this is a person who knows Liz. They say they saw someone driving in the opposite direction that they were going, and they spotted this person for less than a second. The only recognisable detail was that she had the same hair as Liz, and they felt that they should tell the police about this. It's not a confident ID at all though. In the weeks that follow, no one hears from Liz, and that's very unlike her. Her mother, best friend, everyone that knew her say she just vanished. Her bank accounts had not been touched since the moment she went missing, and she even had a cheque from work that she never collected. Money that people say she would have very much needed if she decided to up and leave, seeing as she had next to nothing in her name. Michael is immediately suspected to have had something to do with this, and police bring him in for questioning. Throughout this line of questioning, key moments of interest are that Michael reports he had not physically seen Liz since the incident at the parking lot. Furthermore, he denies making any calls to Sarah's house. When he's confronted with the evidence of the phone trap, he eventually, after much back and forth, admits that he had made those calls. He says he initially lied because he didn't want to get in trouble, seeing as he was already facing assault charges due to the parking lot incident. In his words, he was trying to keep his ass out of jail. The day following her disappearance, July 17th, Michael did not go to work, and when asked why, he says that he was having cramps due to not eating well following Liz leaving him, but he does admit to the detective, through teary eyes, that he understands this all looks very bad for him. Furthermore, a friend who was at Michael's house on the morning of July 17th says that when he got there, Michael was in a drunken state, and he admitted to him that Liz had been at the house, leaving around 5am. A search warrant is obtained for Michael's property, and although nothing seems out of place, there is one interesting thing found. The ring that Liz would wear everywhere, and never took off, was located in a safe in the house. Michael has no explanation for how that got there, and says that he has no idea why it's there. Despite their best efforts, 
police find no leads that go anywhere, and the case goes cold. Over the many years that followed, Liz's mother never gives up hope that her daughter might one day come home. She visits Iowa, where Liz lived, once a year to raise awareness for her missing daughter, and even pays for a billboard to go up, requesting anyone with information for her daughter's whereabouts to come forward. In 2016, 16 years after she vanished, an agent who works on cold cases takes a look at the file, and the details of this missing person are presented to a grand jury, who upon review, returned a bill of indictment. The details of this bill are sealed, and it's unclear if new evidence was found, but what is for certain, is that a week after this happens, Michael is picked up and arrested for first-degree murder. 52-year-old Michael Cyperda faces the full brunt of the law, and he opts for a bench trial, rather than one by jury. As the trial unfolds, all of the information in this video and more is presented to a judge. The state would say, the main question is, is Elizabeth Forshee dead? And if she is, did Michael Cyperda kill her? And if he did, did he act with malice and premeditation? They argue that a body does not need to be recovered to prove death, and that all of the facts regarding her not taking any clothes with her, any money or personal belongings, all indicate that she no longer lives. Furthermore, back in the year 2000, her details were entered into the National Police Database, which would have flagged should she have had any contact with law enforcement. Traffic tickets, arrests, social security number use, bank accounts and so forth. She has been missing for 19 years, and they say it's near impossible for someone who had the relationships with her family and friends that she did to not once reach out and try to contact those that she loved so dearly, especially her mother and brother. They also highlight the fact that not only did Michael physically abuse her on multiple occasions, but that multiple witnesses observed him threatening to kill her, to hide her body, and no one would ever find it. And they say that's exactly what happened here. They also highlight how it's ever so odd that Michael would call Sarah's house constantly, each and every day, but strangely enough, as soon as she goes missing, the phone calls end, when by his own word, he didn't know she was missing until three or four days later, when police had begun questioning him about it. Why would he all of a sudden stop calling if he thought she was still there? The final piece of the argument was Elizabeth's ring which was found in his property, the one she never took off, and him lying to police that he didn't see her since the parking lot incident, but then told a friend he saw her that morning at his house. The defense would argue that she could have taken the ring off when she saw him that morning, and then forgot to put it back on when she left. But that doesn't explain why he would lie to the police, and say he hadn't seen her in a month. The defense, on the other hand, would say that the state has an agenda, and that agenda is not to uncover the truth, but to find Michael guilty at whatever the cost. They highlight inconsistencies in witness testimony, largely ranging from minor errors in their memory, from statements they made in the year 2000, to when this trial happened almost two decades later. The list of all the inconsistencies is extensive, and we'd be here for hours if I went through each one. They highlight poor detective work, leads not followed, witnesses not interviewed, and locations not searched, evidence seemingly destroyed. And ultimately, they say, all the state has is a ring in a safe, a work check not picked up, and heavily inconsistent witness testimony that only serves to paint Michael as an angry and jealous man, but not a killer. All they've managed to prove is that he's likely not the best husband. I know it might sound like I'm passing over the defense's argument quite quickly, but they didn't really have much. They really just picked at little details of what the witnesses had to say, and highlighted inconsistencies at every chance they could. They also didn't really present much evidence. One piece that I saw was a Facebook post from one of the state's witnesses, which shows he despised the defendant. They argue that this witness had a bone to pick with Michael after learning that Michael had slept with his wife. Ultimately though, they didn't really have too much of a defense, 
I mean, it was one of the shortest opening statements that I've ever read. Barely a few sentences. And what that statement said was that the state has a burden of proof to meet, and they will not be able to satisfy that burden. So essentially, when we get to the end of the trial, that is their main defense, that the state has not met the burden of proof. The judge leans towards the state's argument and finds Michael guilty as charged. During sentencing, he says, to within a few hours, 18 years, one month and six days ago, a young woman, 22 years old, had her life taken from her by you. That time period is approximately 6,611 days. In those 6,611 days, Elizabeth would have experienced many things that make life so special. She would have come to know many people and impacted their lives. She may have gone to college. She may have... She would have celebrated many Christmases. She would have times of joy like anyone else. She may have found a career or careers during that time frame. She may have had a family. I bring up these 6,611 days because that is the number of days her family has had to grieve for Elizabeth. Each and every day. Sometimes many times during the day. This is an enormous burden that will never go away. For those reasons, the court believes this sentence to be appropriate. Michael is sentenced to life behind bars. Although, later on, the conviction would be overturned and changed to murder in the second degree, which netted him 50 years, 30 of them to be served before parole eligibility. It's at this point in the video that I move away from court documents and research. I now speak from my own thoughts and opinions on this case. Despite my thoughts being that he likely committed the crime, it does strike me as a pretty weak case by the state. The defense is not wrong when they said it was a flimsy exercise in how to turn light circumstantial evidence into a murder conviction. But those thoughts didn't hang around for long because I had begun to read court documentation regarding evidence that the defense attempted to get suppressed from the trial. The list of testimony which was attempted to be set as off-limits is extensive, and from what I can tell, they succeeded in getting most of it ruled out. It's pretty eyebrow-raising stuff. Let me go over some of the details with you now. In regards to Michael's ex-wife Sally testifying, she was unable to speak about any sexual activity that occurred between her, Michael, and Liz whilst they were all living together. Any reference to the nature of the relationship between Liz and Michael prior to the divorce, and there was to be no reference to prior abusive, manipulative, controlling and harassing behaviour leading up to her divorce, or that Michael threatened her during their relationship. No statement was to be made that he said he would kill her and bury her in the yard, and that no one would miss her. She was unable to speak about a time when Michael locked her in the basement until it was cleaned to his satisfaction. She was unable to mention that he was coaching her on what to say to the police, or that he told her no one would go out with him if Liz left him. He told her that she was not allowed to say anything until the body was found. No statements were to be made that characterize him as a liar, or that he doesn't think about consequences until after he goes ballistic. Suppressed information relating to Sarah, Liz's girlfriend. She couldn't speak about a time where Michael had chased her off his property with a baseball bat, then later accused her of hitting his children with that very bat. No statements were to be made about the kids saying anything along the lines of, they didn't think Liz would be coming home. Another woman called Marsha Murray, an ex-girlfriend of Michael, she was restricted from talking about an incident where Michael pushed her out of his truck, ran her over and laughed, then told her to tell people she fell down. She couldn't make any statement that he would get mad when he had to assist her in any way, or that he has no conscience and only cares about himself, that it's his way or the highway, and that he's not right and a very sick man. She was not allowed to speak about a very eyebrow-raising comment that Michael had made to her. He had said, if she didn't break up with him, she'd probably be the one missing. 
Michael's own mother was suppressed from making statements that she knew his relationship with Liz was sexual prior to them moving to Iowa. Liz's best friend was unable to talk about the fact that she knew Michael would demand sexual favours from Liz just so that she could have the ability to contact her via the phone, or that he supplied and forced her to use drugs. Liz's friend, whom she met at church, Harper, was prevented from discussing an incident where she witnessed one of their friends advise Liz not to marry Michael. This angered the man, and as a result, he chased this friend around the yard with a shovel, attempting to club him. She was not allowed to make mention of the fact that Liz said she had stuff on Michael, which was really bad for him if it got out, and that he has said things such as, he snowed people that he needed to snow. And finally, a woman by the name of Angela, who dated Michael in 2012, was not allowed to testify about details such as, he would check her odometer to make sure she wasn't going places he didn't approve, or that he would park outside of her work, sit in his truck, and watch her all day to make sure she didn't go anywhere. She also was not allowed to make reference to the fact that during sex, Michael would place her in chokeholds and say things like, how would you like your neck to be broken? She was not allowed to discuss Michael's demeanor when the topic of Liz would come up, and that he would become tight-lipped and suspicious, or that his very own mother had told her that he did it, and that she believes Liz is out in the woods somewhere. She was not allowed to mention that he had bragged to a number of people that when he did it, it was very fast. She was unable to reference times where Michael would tell her, braggingly, that he was the king of domestics. She also says that Michael would try to entice her to have sex with other women in front of him, and that he does drugs such as speed all the time. There were multiple occasions where he would get so angry at his mother that he would get in her face and scream, and it got so bad that Angela would need to intervene because she was concerned for what he might do. I mean, I'm gonna stop reading there, because it just keeps going on and on. What an absolute menace of a human being. If he didn't commit the crime, which I truly believe he did, at least now this monster, this king of domestics as he refers to himself, is not out there terrorizing more people. Those suppressed details were just some of the never-ending pages upon pages of this behavior that were outlined in court documents. I don't have much more to say on the man. I believe including all of those suppressed statements sums up adequately how I feel about him. Truly a disgusting piece of work. It's hard for me to say much about Liz. There's really no information about her out there. For the most part though, from what I could find, she seemed like a really beautiful child. A child that at the age of 13, a monster got his claws into her and didn't let go. There are reports that she had drinking problems. But ultimately, if she did, I imagine this was a coping mechanism. When most other young teens are developing friendships and securing their place in the world, she was at the mercy of a tyrant. That stunts a person's growth. She never had the opportunity to become the person she was on track to being before she had met Michael. He isolated her from family. He forced her out of proper schooling and ensured that she could only work unskilled jobs that he approved of. The bright, kind, and innocent young girl that had life before her, her light had been snuffed out before it barely began. Like a little flower bud that is removed from its environment and planted in the desert, now withering in the heat of the sun that was Michael Cyperda. Elizabeth Forshe seemed like a vibrant young person, one that had slowly been dying at the hands of this man long before she disappeared. Two victim impact statements were presented to the judge during sentencing, one from Liz's mother and one from her brother. I'll read excerpts from them now. Liz's mother, Elizabeth Nicole Forshe, or as most of us called her, Lizzie, is my first-born child, and I would do almost anything to have her with us here today. I will forever live with the question of how I could have prevented this from happening. The first, worst day of our lives was when Mike Cyperda moved in across the street and started grooming my daughter. She was such a sweet, vulnerable girl. The second worst day 
was when he convinced her to move to Iowa with him. And then the worst day of them all was when Mike Saperta decided if he couldn't have Liz, no one could. He took my precious daughter away from all of her family and friends when all he had to do was give her the divorce she so desperately wanted. Every day I think about my beautiful Lizzie, and all I can do is imagine what she would be doing today. I miss talking to her, laughing with her, hugging her. Mike Saperda has never shown any remorse. If he had an ounce of decency or compassion for anyone, including his own children, he would tell us where she is. Without answers, we have to live this nightmare over and over every day. Liz's brother. It is ironic that we sit here today, August 23rd, 2018, as 25 years ago to the day our father lost his fight against cancer. After he died, Michael began grooming her. Liz, as a 14-year-old girl, under the pretense of babysitting his kids, he controlled and manipulated her took her across the country and isolated her from family. The bond between a brother and sister is one that cannot be measured nor justly put into words. You spend your entire childhood alongside one another, every day playing, every night eating dinner, Christmas, birthdays, and so on, until you reach the age you move out and start independent lives. The bond of what was created in childhood is a lifelong tie to the other person. I'll never. I will never again enjoy the benefit. I will never again enjoy this benefit of life. Mike Saperda is a manipulative, cruel person with a pattern of abuse and no regard for another human's life, not to mention the lives affected by her absence. He intentionally took my sister from this world. For this reason, I pray that he may never be allowed to darken the doorstep of another family's home as long as he shall live.